This is the uh, <clears throat> Sukkot Shabbat. So the Shabbat that occurs during the midst of the week of Sukkot. And uh, it's October 6th, 2012 on our calendar here in the United States. And the 20th of Tishri, uh, 5773 on the Hebrew calendar. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, what I had said earlier was my message is going to be based upon the Torah portion, which uh, is a special portion uh, because it is a um, festival Shabbat. And the portion begins with chapter 33 of Shemot, Exodus, verse 12, and ends with chapter 34, verse 26. And I'm going to, for the sake of my message, I'm going to be stopping with chapter 34, verse 9 instead. But we're going to read this. So Shemot, Exodus 33, 12. And what I have entitled my message is A Temporary Home. Moshe said to Adonai, Look, you say to me, make these people move on. But you haven't let me know whom you'll be sending with me. <coughs> Nevertheless, you have said, I know you by name, and also you have found favor in my sight. Now please, if it is really the case that I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways, so that I will understand you and continue finding favor in your sight. Moreover, keep on seeing this nation as your people. He answered, that is, God answered, Set your mind at rest. My presence will go with you after all. Moshe replied, If your presence doesn't go with us, don't make us go on from here. For how else is it to be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, other than by your going with us. That is what distinguishes us, me and your people, from all the other peoples on the earth. Adonai said to Moshe, I will also do what you have asked me to do because you have found favor in my sight and I know you by name. And again, whenever it says, whenever we see name, when he says, I know you by name, it doesn't just mean, I know what your name is. It means, I know you by your reputation, by your, what you have faithfully done in your life. Okay? But Moshe said, I beg you to show me your glory. He replied, I will cause all my goodness to pass before you, and in your presence I will pronounce the name of Adonai. Moreover, I show favor to whomever I will, and I display mercy to whomever I will. But my face, he continued, you cannot see because a human being cannot look at me and remain alive. Here, he said, is a place near me. Stand on the rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you inside a crevice in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face is not to be seen. Adonai said to Moshe, cut yourself two tablets of stone like the first ones, and I will inscribe on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready by morning. In the morning you are to ascend Mount Sinai and present yourself to me on the top of the mountain. No one is to come up with you, and no one is to be seen anywhere on the mountain. Don't even let the flocks or herds feed in front of this mountain. Moshe cut two stone tablets like the first. Then he got up early in the morning, and with the two stone tablets in his hands, ascended Mount Sinai, as Adonai had ordered him to do. Adonai descended in the cloud, stood with him there, and pronounced the name the reputation, the character, the essence, the nature of Adonai. 
And I passed before him and proclaimed, Yudhe Vavhe. Yudhe Vavhe, Adonai is God, merciful and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in grace and truth, showing grace to the thousandth generation, forgiving offenses, crimes, and sins, yet not exonerating the guilty, but causing the negative effects of the parents' offenses to be experienced by their children and grandchildren and even by the third and fourth generations. At once Moshe bowed his head to the ground, prostrated himself, and said, If I have now found favor in your view, Adonai, then please let Adonai go with us, even though they are a stiff-necked people, and pardon our offenses and our sin, and take us as your possession. Obviously, the whole point of Sukkot is to cause the people of Israel to remember the events of wandering through the wilderness by bringing us out of our normal dwellings and causing us to stay for a week, actually eight days, in temporary shelters temporary dwellings, whether it be a quote-unquote sukkah like we have out here or a tent. Um, it is a temporary dwelling. It's a dwelling that as well as they make these tents, um, if it rains, I still get puddles of water in my tent. They leak. Okay? And of course, they have no insulation whatsoever. So whatever the temperature is outside is the temperature that you're going to feel if you're in a tent. You don't have the creature comforts in a tent that you have in your house. And that's on purpose. And what I want to bring to you is an argument that two famous rabbis had with one another they, they had frequent arguments with one another. And what's interesting is that usually these two men, Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Akiva, would end up arriving at the same destination, but they always came at it from different points of view. Okay? And so they would argue the merits of their particular point of view. But ultimately, they would end in the same place. Rabbi Eliezer described or, or likened the sukkah to the cloud of glory that covered the people of Israel when they were in the wilderness. And so it's a very... The cloud of glory is on the part of God was an act of, of great love and mercy and care for the people of Israel and showed, according to Rabbi Eliezer, his pleasure with the people of Israel and the very fact that he was there in presence and dwelt in their midst showed that God was pleased with the people of Israel. Rabbi Akiva argues that the sukkah was, that we don't need to liken the cloud of glory that covered them to the sukkah, that the sukkah is just a literal booth that is built for themselves. But the reason why <clears throat> they both take, they each take these tacks is because they really are two sides of the same coin. Rabbi Eliezer, who saw it as representing the cloud of glory, saw the sukkah as the covering shelter of the presence of God. So whenever you leave your home and you go into the sukkah, it's to remind you of the presence of God covering you. Okay? <clears throat> 
and therefore was a was to be a visual aid to the people of Israel to learn to trust to learn to trust God because when they were wandering through the wilderness everything that they did while they were out there was dependent upon God their provision of food their provision of water whether they stayed or traveled you know everything was dependent upon God and the presence of God and communicating with God okay so he directed all of their steps and so they had to learn they came from a situation where they had cruel masters that also guided everything that they did but from a very different standpoint from a from a standpoint of cruelty and you will do what I say no matter what and if you don't then you're going to be beaten maybe killed um, and so the Lord is trying to teach them how to trust him and his goodness and so the sukkah represents God's sheltering presence according to Rabbi Eliezer Rabbi Akiva on the other hand saw the sukkah as just simply a modest temporary dwelling and Rabbi Akiva was always critical of the people of Israel during the, the wilderness wandering he always talked about the fact that Israel complained about everything and Israel wanted to return to Egypt all the time and he points out that the reason why they wanted to return to Egypt was because they were instead of trusting in God they were trusting in a false sense of security that is brought by bricks and mortar and by the fact that you have an established dwelling that's always the same it's sameness okay so they're finding security in the sameness of life that everything would always be as it had been and he points out you know where whereas uh, Rabbi Eliezer elevates the people of Israel and praises them for for their attributes Rab, Rabbi Akiva says Pah, these are the people that died in the wilderness because they wouldn't trust God okay so Rabbi Akiva's point is well taken and well stated in that we are at risk of making an idol out of our very home and the daily sameness of the life that we live and that's why it's important to actually do Sukkot and to leave the comfort of your home and to come out and dwell in a sukkah or a tent okay and this is a quote from Rabbi Akiva to believe there is real security in mortar and bricks is to erect a false god worse than the generation that built the tower of Babel are those who see the works of their own hands and declares you are a god end quote and so the reason you know when we watch the national news the evening news and we see reports around the world here in America or other countries of the results of floods fires tornadoes hurricanes earthquakes tsunamis you know any of those kinds of things that wipe out entire villages and nothing is left but just rubble the reason why that tears at us so deeply is because it causes us to face the reality that even if our home is made from tough stuff brick and mortar 
we are still very vulnerable and that life is fragile and that the brick and mortar can't save us because when those things happen when the twin towers come crashing down because two planes fly into them and 3,000 people perish it reminds us that these big even these big tall structures that the structural engineers have created and that would stand under normal circumstances are still vulnerable and that we can die in an instant. We just learned last night for those of you who were with us when we were at EBC we learned just last night that the wife of the man who was the pastor at EBC, Lisa Dutton, passed away on September 1st in her sleep. She was 54. That's between Devers and my age. And, you know, you think about you think about that and, it's, and you're going, that's too early. You know, that's the, your, your first thought. And these were people that were friends of ours. We had known them for years. And it's just a shock. She passed away on September 1st. And uh, I can't imagine what, what Mike is going through right now. But, you know, and, and then I have, I have the personal story of falling from the scaffolding in 1995 and shattering, I shattered the radius into small pieces in my right arm and broke the end off the ulna. My hand and my wrist were literally sitting on top of these bones. And they had to reconstruct and put me in an external fixator. I was in that and in rehab for six months trying to get the use back in my wrist and my arm. And it happened just like that. One minute I'm painting, and the next minute I'm on the ground with my arm shattered. And you, it just, those things happen, can happen in a moment. And it changes everything. As a result of that, I lost my job that I had had for years. It was a very good job. And it was because of that event, though, that it broke me loose from corporate America so that I would end up here today. But the point is that there is nothing in this world that can keep us safe. Nothing. We are vulnerable and we are fragile. So our ultimate security cannot come from any of the temporal things that exist here on the world. Our trust and our security, excuse me, our, our security has to come from trust not from the physical. And so that's why love of God and love of our neighbor is so important. Because it's in those that we develop the trust that bring us the security. You guys have seen over and over, just like I have, that in those cases where there are major disasters in an area, total strangers will help their neighbor. And that is where security is. In, tra in relationship with, with God and with people. And so Rabbi Eliezer sees the sukkah as representing security. Rabbi Akiva sees the sukkah as representing insecurity. But they both reach the same conclusion 
because their end conclusion is true security, security, ultimate security, is only found in God. Whether you say the sukkah is the covering presence of God, or you're saying the sukkah indicates the, the temporality of life, the fragility of life, and that you have to trust in God, it always both go back to God is our security. I want to share with you, um, and I told the people that were here last night for the Arab Shabbat uh, time that we had, that I would be sharing part of what is traditionally declared together for Arab Shabbat. And that's, I'm going to, I want to share with you part of Psalm 121. Specifically verses 5 through 8. Where it is declared to Israel by David. Adonai is your guardian. At your right hand Adonai provides you with shade. The sun can't strike you during the day or even the moon at night. Adonai will guard you against all harm. He will guard your life. Adonai will guard your coming and going from now on and forever. Israel is facing threats that it has never faced in its history right now since 1948. There are 40,000 rockets aimed at Israel from Lebanon. There's a massive chemical weapons arsenal in Syria. And I don't know if you guys know this or not, but southern Lebanon has basically become a fortress zone. They took over Hezbollah took over 100 villages along the southern border of Lebanon and turned them into Hezbollah fortress towns. Okay? So people don't even live there anymore. They're, it's strictly military okay? along the southern border of Lebanon. Of course, there's the continuous rockets and mortars that come from Gaza. Iran is vowing to annihilate Israel. Egypt is now controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood and is in the process of turning their back on the agreement that Egypt and Israel had with one another. And I don't know if you guys have noticed in the news or not, but Arab Spring has come to Jordan. And they're beginning to riot in Jordan and call for the ouster of the king of Jordan. And so, when we look at all of these different things like this, it just really brings home our vulnerability. And so, I want to, re I want to end by returning to the portion of Scripture that we started with. Shemot, Exodus 33. Because there are some declarations that Moshe makes and that God makes. Moshe requests of God. He says, keep on seeing this nation as your people. <coughs> he says, if you don't, 
If you're not the one that's going to go with us, we don't want to move from here. And I, I really think, I know that there's this big long section of the speech where he talks about if I have found favor in your sight, I and the people, and how will people, the other people know that we have favor unless you go with us. I, I really... Favor, or just being able for the people around them to see that they have the favor of God, that, that's important. But it's more important, and I'm sure Moshe understood this, that as they moved on and they encountered the various peoples that they were going to encounter, especially after they crossed over into the land of promise, he understood that the might, the power of God had to go with them or they would not be successful in what God had said that they were supposed to do in order to take possession of the promised land. And so he wanted for God to make it visible to the people, the other nations around them, that as they traveled through, that God was very clearly present with them. So it would put fear in the hearts of the people. And Moshe is doing in essence in this passage is doing what we as individuals need to be doing. Moshe understands what we've been talking about. That the only salvation, the only security is in God. And so what, what is it that he wants to do? He wants to get as close to God as possible. He wants to know God. He wants to be intimate with God. He wants to be with God. That's the reason why he's willing in the face of, you know, by now he's already gone up one time. And he hasn't been destroyed as a result. But before that first time that he went up, he, like all the other people, had, had heard God make the declaration that if anybody comes near this mountain, they're going to be destroyed. And so I, there had to have been some trepidation in his heart as God said, come up here and be with me in this cloud of presence and power, lightning and fire and smoke and all of that on top of the mountain. But Moshe is more interested in being close to God than even living. And so he was willing to venture in the face of death into the presence of God. But he doesn't stop there. In this passage he says, I, I, I don't want to just be in this cloud and smoke and in the midst of the fire and lightning and all that, that he understood that was a manifestation of God that wasn't God himself. He says, I want to see you. Not just some, something that you're manifesting. Not just your power. I want to see you. I know we've talked about this many, many, many times through the years. But it bears repeating again. And it's always true. It always will be true. That because of the things that are currently happening, happening, that will continue to happen, that will get worse in the world, because the world system is, all, is spinning down. We're headed towards what we read in the Scripture that must come before the end. Yeshua prophesied it. The prophets of old prophesied it. That it had to happen. The things that we know today that we expect to always be the same today that we trust in and have security in at some point, whether it's in our lifetime or the next generation's lifetime, it's all going to go away. 
And what God is wanting from us is not just merely that we will be able to survive and exist in, the, in that kind of a state or situation. He is wanting us to be... We just recently watched again here together the, the group that was here for Sukkot. We watched the movie The Avengers. How many of you have actually seen that movie? You know, n normally, normally I wouldn't recommend a science fiction movie to you guys. But I recommend this one. And the reason why is because the metaphorical representation of the kingdom of darkness and kingdom of light in the characters that are in that movie, they're just so apparent. And there is our, our favorite scene in the whole movie in this particular movie, Loki, who is a mythical character from Norse mythology, Loki is the bad guy. Loki, the way they present the character of Loki in that movie, he is the way that you know Hasatan is. Okay? And there's one point in the movie during the battle because there's actually a physical battle that's going on between the Avengers and an army that's unleashed from the heavens of creatures that are like demons that come down and begin attacking everybody and just their whole intent is just to destroy everybody and everything. But there's an encounter between the superhero, the Hulk, and Loki. And Loki thinks he is all that. He's strutting around, talking about himself being a god, and everybody needs to bow down to him. And in this encounter, the Hulk basically grabs Loki by the legs and is just slamming him around on the concrete and leaves him in a crumpled heap and his comment Hulk's comment of course he's this big like when he when he turns into the Hulk he's like real dumb and everything so he he talks very um, short short statements his statement is puny God puny God. You know, because Loki is bragging about himself being a god before Hulk takes him and makes a rag doll out of him. And Hulk says, puny God. Well, to me, I was seeing Hasatan and Yeshua. Believe it or not, in that scene. Because Hasatan has gone around the world bragging about being a god and that he's going to take over and rule everything and Yeshua comes along and slams him into the concrete and says you're not a god and there is someone greater than you and it's me and so what God is wanting us to do, the scripture says, that we have been seated in heavenly places with Yeshua. He's wanting us to dwell in that place with Him. So that no matter what goes on around here, His presence, His authority, His power is transferred to us so that whatever goes on 
We are like those Avengers that work together for the kingdom of light to overcome the kingdom of darkness. But we don't gain that kind of power and authority on our own. That doesn't come from us. It comes from Him. And it only comes from Him when we're in His presence and with Him. And our tendency as human beings, all of, all of us, me included, and this is what I've been going through recently, we mistakenly believe that we have the power and ability to accomplish things here in this earthly realm and we take the weight of responsibility that should only belong to God to accomplish those things. Even if, even if God said, I want you to do thus and such, whatever it is. We cannot, we do not have the ability to take what He has said and try to go do it on our own. And in our own power. You know, when the scripture says that it was not by works that we're saved, but it's by grace and faith that we're saved, that scripture tells us that even the grace and the faith necessary to be saved comes from God. So, even to be redeemed by God, we have to get something from Him in order to be redeemed. So there's not anything that we can do on our own to accomplish anything that He wants us to accomplish. It has to be with Him and in His power and authority or it will not be done. Or we will burn out will get tired and say, I don't want to do this anymore. Because we run out of our own power. And so, it's absolutely necessary for us to realize that all around us is temporary and the only security is in Him. That's where we need to go. We need to go to the place of security. We need to be with Yeshua in heavenly places. I have been, and I'm going to finish with this, I have been struggling because I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is doing things and is going to do things in and through this congregation. I have been so under the weight of responsibility in regards to building the building, trying to get all the ducks in a row and all of that for months now. And every time because I felt inside of me something is wrong. I kept asking God, are we supposed to build this building? And he, every time I've asked, he said, yes. Are we supposed to do it now? Yes. Are we supposed to do it the way that we're doing it, where we're going to the bank and taking out a loan? Yes. So every time I ask, it, that's always yes. And so when I get that answer, then it's like, okay, if we're supposed to be doing all of this, why do I feel, I, I feel like something's wrong, I don't understand. Okay, if I'm doing the right thing, the thing that you want me to do, the way that you want me to do it, what's going on? Why don't I feel good or right about What's happening? And the issue isn't the building. See, that's the problem. It never was the building. The issue isn't the, 
whether or not I'm doing the other responsibilities that I have, whether I'm doing them correctly or not. God knows that I'm the kind of person He could ask me to do anything physically and I would run myself into the ground making sure it got accomplished. The problem isn't there. The problem is in here. And while I have been so busy with all the doing, I haven't taken time to be. And, and I did a message sort of like this a few weeks ago. But that really is, that really is the issue. And if we don't take the time to be, we don't go to that place of security. We can't do. Even if it's what God said to do. So, I actually don't know how to wrap this up. <laughs> Just, what's that? Oh, well, no, we don't need to do that. I know you want to, but we don't need to do that. I guess the best way to end is just pray. <sighs> Father, I I pray for myself and for everybody here. That there would not be anything in this realm of existence that we would knowingly or unknowingly turn into a God. Turn into the source of our security the source of our ability, the source of our power or authority. Father, that in the midst of all of the responsibilities that we have to do, that we will remember to be. That we will remember that our abilities and our security and our power and authority, they all come from you. Everything that we are, everything that we have comes from you. Father, help us to always remember that it is only you who sustains our life and that in one moment we can be breathing and in the next not be breathing. Father, our trust has to be in you and we declare that our trust is in you. Help our trust. Help us to trust you more, Lord God. In Yeshua's name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, 
our Lord, our righteousness, our salvation, the Prince of Peace. Amen.